shrublands across the world is a biome that mainly consists of shrubs. Shrubs are tougher than trees and occupy the space in between the plants. Similar to trees, they have wooden stems but do not occupy more than few feet tall. The one thing in common that the shrublands across the world have is that they grow in areas where water is scarce for several months every year. The climate here may be too dry for trees to grow, but the moisture here is enough to prevent the land from converting into a desert. Shrubland has a variety of names and is also known as scrub or scrubland by many experts. In Australia, the shrubland is simply known as bush. This shrubland on California coast in North America contains variety of plants and is called chaparral. Many offshore islands and great number of coastal hills in Southern California were originally covered by chaparral. During the winter storms, the chaparral plants play an important role by holding the soil in place. But unfortunately, only 1% of the chaparral plant life remains as the rest of the plant life have been removed by the people in favor of fruit farms and vineyards. It has also served as a backdrop of dozens of Hollywood films. On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and surrounding the shores of the Mediterranean, the coast and the hillsides are embraced by shrubland. Shrublands are also found in Africa and in the tropical region of Africa, dry shrubland merges into savanna. While further south, in the Cape region, it forms a dense green carpet. This form of shrubland is called finbos and constitutes most concentrated variety of plants on earth. The climate of the shrubland is uneven and can be compared to the strong sunshine and dust-laden winds. Shrublands are not always dry and can receive 200 millimeters of rain in a year. But the rain is unevenly spread and a lot of rain might arrive within a short time, making the rest of the year endlessly dry. This makes it hard for the trees to survive in the shrublands. The shrublands experiences a mixture of moist winters and dry summers. This kind of climate is known as Mediterranean climate. But it is not that only the Mediterranean region experiences this kind of climate. All over the globe, ranging from California and Chile to South Africa and Western Australia, there is a similarity in the conditions giving rise to similar shrubland plants. This type of climate is ideal for grapevines. That is the reason why so many of the world's wines come from these parts of the world. Wind and fire are also natural occurrences that shape the life of the shrublands. As summer arrives, daytime breeze blows onto the land from the sea. But sometimes it so happens that the wind swings around and starts blowing from inland. During such an occurrence, the conditions of shrubland can quickly change. In Southern California, when the Santa Ana wind blows, it brings with itself hot and dusty air from the desert, causing the temperature to shoot up. Being hot and bone dry, it has the capacity to turn sparks into major forest fires. These fires are fierce and can move faster than a man can run. During these fires, shrubs are charred and blackened. The trees are killed by the heat generated by the fire. This in turn stops shrubland from becoming a forest. The shrubland plants have learned to cope up with this threat and once the fire dies out, 
most of the plants re-sprout from the ground. But humans find it hard to cope with such a massive fire, as sometimes their home comes in the way of the raging fire. On the periphery of the desert, the climate gets drier than the Mediterranean climate. Here, shrubs have to fight a continuous battle to stay alive. Many shrubs living on the edge of the desert survive in dry river beds. Here, flash floods occur after sudden storms. Till the flood arrives, there is no sign of water on the land surface. But water remains collected underground beneath the dry river bed. The shrubs soak up the leftover moisture for their survival. As rain falls on the dry shrub land, it creates a lot of problems for that area. The rainwater, instead of soaking in the ground, can run off the dry ground, thus forming sudden floods. These floods in turn dissolve salts from the ground and carry it downhill. After the sun comes out, pools and puddles left by the flood dry up, leaving the salt behind, which in turn spells danger for the plants. The salt makes it hard for the plants to soak water and finally kills its roots. But there are some shrubs that have learned to survive even in salty soil. Like the salt bushes on Australia's Nullarbor Plain. Nullarbor means no tree. This plain is flat and twice as big as England. Similar to salt bushes in other dry shrublands, the Nullarbo salt bushes too have a means of getting rid of the excess salt. They do this by making crystals of the salt on their leaves. This gives the salt bushes on this plane a grey-green colour and a rough texture. These crystals reflect sunlight and keep the salt bushes cool. Small trees also grow here but salt bushes are the most common plants. The salt bushes rule the plain and stretch from horizon to horizon and create a vast lonely landscape. This landscape can be crossed by railway that does not require bending for 500 kilometers, thus forming the longest straight stretch of railway in the world. Shrublands in the tropics find themselves crowded out by other plants and trees. The reason behind this is the wet climate of the tropics. This wet climate allows forest and grassland to flourish, not giving enough space for shrubs to flourish. But in northeast Brazil and some parts of Africa, each year there is a long dry season making it hard for trees and grasses to survive. Here, the shrubs have an upper hand and they thrive. Totally opposite of the Mediterranean climate, here, rain falls at the hottest time of the year. As the climate switches from wet to dry, it has a great effect on the area. During the wet season, the shrubs are so much covered with leaves that even large animals are hidden. But as dry season sets in, Many of the shrubs lose their foliage and the grass between these shrubs do die. Now there is much less cover and this becomes the best time to watch the wildlife here because there are fewer places for animals to hide. During this time the water holes are also busy as animals arrive from far and wide to drink water from these holes. The number of large plant eaters found in Africa is more than anywhere else on the earth. So to survive from these plant eaters, many shrubs and trees have spines and thorns for their self-defense. In the dry season, their branches stand out like barbed wires 
and anything that tangles with them can take a long time to work itself free. But there are animals like black rhino that are so tough that they can even eat these thorny shrubs. The climate in the cold windswept coast gives shrubs the edge over trees to flourish. The shores of northern Germany and Denmark and the western shores of England experience this kind of environment. The wind can lash these coasts with salt-laden spray at a speed of more than 103 km per hour. The storm force wind is strong enough to uproot trees and knock people off their feet. But shrubs like gorse and buckthorn are small and tough to stay in place under such severe conditions. These shrubs at the coast work as natural windbreaks creating a sheltered microclimate near the ground. Microclimate is a pattern of weather within a small area like a valley, treetop or burrow. Inside these microclimates, animals can sit safely till the storm dies out and it is safe to come outside. These shrubs are lopsided and have their twigs and branches pointing inland because the sea breeze almost always blows from the same direction. So shrublands can be created or destroyed depending on the climate of the region. But climate is not the only reason. Even humans can greatly affect the shrublands. Research done by scientists clearly indicates that some shrubland regions are not nearly as natural as they seem. For example, one of the largest shrubland areas found around the Mediterranean Sea was most likely formed when people began to farm the land and cut down many of the trees. Around 10,000 years ago, the area surrounding the Mediterranean was thickly forested with the forest stretching down to the shore. With the expansion of farming, more and more spaces were opened up for the crops to be grown and animals to feed. The forests were destroyed and when new saplings grew, the goats nibbled them up and stopped the forest to grow back. The story of the Mediterranean reveals that it is not just the climate, but humans too have been responsible for the creation of shrublands that is seen today existing on the planet Earth. The shrubland has one of its harshest areas on planet Earth called the Gran Chaco. Spanning across Argentina, Bolivia and Paraguay, the Gran Chaco is a plain of silty sand. The sand in some places here is 5,000 feet deep, which is six times the height of the Canary Walk Tower in London. Bigger than the whole of France, the Grand Chaco experiences fierce summer heat and is filled with thorny scrub. Many poisonous snakes have made it their home and the most poisonous is a viper called the Urutu. The humans who are bitten by it develop blisters and bleed from their nose and gums. A wide variety of shrubs and trees are found in the Gran Chaco. The one tree that is most useful for the local farmers is the Quebraco tree. The word Quebraco means axe breaker and the name given to it is because the wood of this tree is rock hard. The wood of the Quebraco is so heavy that it does not float in water and even the termites find the wood difficult to attack. This quality of the wood makes it very useful for fencing poles. The bark of this tree is also a good source for tannin, which is used to tan leather. It is also used for making dyes and inks. 
tannin also serves as a chemical armory for the quebraco tree, helping it defend against insect and fungal attack. Shrubs are considered to be tough customers as they have to cope up with damage that would kill many other plants. Besides hot sunshine and long and never-ending droughts, the shrubs have to survive hungry animals and the threat of catching fire. But even after being eaten, chopped down and set on fire, many of the shrubs just grow back. To witness the rebirth of shrubs from the ashes and see how they bounce back, the best place is in the interior of southern Australia. Here, Mali shrubland covers thousands of square kilometers. Malis are gum trees that are small with twisted stems. They may not be the most beautiful plants, but when it comes to staying alive in harsh conditions, they surely come out as winners. The Mali shrub is responsible for the fire that sweeps across the forest. As a Mali shrub grows, it drops its dead leaves and old branches on the ground. These then mixes with the dry grasses and the hot sunshine bakes it, creating the right conditions to start a fire. Under such condition, a lightning or a discarded cigarette is all that is needed to make this fuel go up in flames. In less than an hour, the flames can raise through thousands of hectares of land. These blazes pose a deadly danger for crickets and lizards that live there. Even birds are threatened with the roaring fire when the Malis burst into flames. After a fierce fire, it is assumed that the forest will take a long time to recover. But surprisingly enough, the shrubland stages an incredible recovery. In just weeks, the charred trunks sprout new stems and leaves. The dormant or inactive seeds that were lying buried in the ground start to sprout, turning the cleared ground between the shrubs green. Now, there is no danger of another fire striking for a long, long time as all the dead wood and leaves have been completely burned. It is interesting to know how these Malis stage such a miraculous comeback. Each Malis has a stock of water and food hidden in a swollen root called a lignotuber which stays safely buried inside the ground. Sometimes, as big as a wheelbarrow, lignotubers contain all that Mali's need to get going after a disaster. Just as Mali's are found only in Australia, there are many shrubland plants that are found only in one part of the world. Even though these shrubland plants may appear different, and live far away from each other. They share some features that let them live in the same conditions. One of these features is the aromatic smell. This smell comes from oils in the leaves, which evaporate when the leaves are touched or bruised. Some of these smells are not pleasant to human nose, while some smells like lavender and sage are much more pleasant. As a result, these plants are used for making perfumes or for flavoring food. These plant oils are used by the shrubs to protect themselves. Oils prevent leaves from losing too much water in hot sunshine. Oil also guards the plants from being eaten 
by the hungry animals as it is difficult to digest oily leaves. Farm animals help these oily plants to grow in large quantities by eating away the tastier non-oily plants. After experiencing several months of drought, the ground between the shrubs may appear barren. But it is not so. Hidden under the ground are a host of plants just waiting for the right moment to arrive so that they can sprout. These plants are the shrubland summer sleepers. These summer sleepers are plants that disappear during the hottest time of the year. Sea squill found in southern Europe is one of the biggest sleeping plants. It has a swollen wound as big as a football packed with poison that helps keep hungry animals away from it. In winter, the plant has fleshy, shiny leaves which die away in spring. As summer reaches its peak, the leaves completely disappear and the plant goes into its deep summer rest. As summer comes to an end, the plant bursts into flowers. Shrubland plants can be very ruthless when it comes to defending their own patch of ground. They can even resort to chemical warfare. These plants produce poisonous chemicals that seep through the soil and prevent other plants to grow nearby. Sagebrush found in Western USA is found to use such kind of tactics. Where there are plants, there is bound to be visitors on the wing. During their growing stages, the plants need to keep the animals away. But when they start flowering, they need the help of animals to spread their pollen and seeds. Attracting the right kind of visitors at the right time is an important aspect for shrubland plants. The plants of shrubland located to the north of equator rely on insects to pollinate their flowers. In southern hemisphere, a large number of shrubs attract birds instead of insects. As the birds are heavier, the flowers have to be tough and have to double up as a feeding station for the birds. One of the most spectacular bird pollinated plants is the King Protea of South Africa. Standing six feet tall, it is an evergreen bush studded with flower heads shaped like giant ice cream cones and surrounded by spiky flaps. Each of the flower head is made up of several hundred mini flowers. Looking at the King Protea in its full bloom presents a fabulous sight. This is the reason it has been declared South Africa's national flower. There are more than 100 varieties of Proteas and a minimum of half of these varieties use birds to spread their pollen. In Australia, Thousands of kilometers to the east, the Banksia's shrub have similar flower heads and live in the same manner as their South African counterpart. It is important for plants to spread their seeds in order to give them the best chance to find open space and grow. The shrubland plants also use various means to spread their seeds far and away like a sudden snap followed by a brief pattering on the ground is a common sound in the shrubland during sunny days. This is the noise of exploding pods. It is one of the ways used by shrubs to scatter their seeds. The pods build up tension like winding up of a spring. As sunshine dries the pod, the two sides try to twist. When the pod eventually splits open, the sides suddenly curl 
hurling the seeds into the air. A big pod has the capacity to catapult seeds at a distance several meters away from the safety of the shade of the parent tree. For even longer distance, they rely on two modes, namely animals and the wind. Many shrubs have feathery seeds that can be easily blown by the wind and many have unusual ways of using the breeze. The bladder senna grows pods that are like miniature balloons. When the pods are ripe, they are broken off from the plant by the wind and they bounce like small pieces of litter across the floor. Some plants even have their seeds spread by ants carrying them away. The seeds of a type of protea, called a common pagoda or rooster pea, are spread by the ants. Found in the finboss of South Africa's Western Cape, the seeds of rooster pea are coated with a substance that the ants are attracted to. But the inner part of the seed is difficult for the ants to break open. When the ants find the seed, they quickly take it underground and chew on the tasty part, leaving the rest of the seed to germinate and grow. Usually, the seeds are scattered by the plants as soon as they are ripe. But there are some shrubs that are not ready to let go of their seeds. The proteas and banksias shut up their seeds inside old flower heads or tough pods. They have the capacity to hold on to their seeds for more than 20 years. It is a strange thing to do, yet they do it. The reason behind this is that for such kind of plants, fire is the key. Unless and until there is a blaze, they keep protecting their seeds because the fire clears away most of the plant from the ground, leaving open ground. Once the flower heads or pots have been scorched, they open up and drop their seeds on the fertile bed of ash. The greasewood of California has its own way to ensure that their seeds sprout at the right time. The plant drops its seed as soon as it flowers and the seeds lie waiting in the soil. In order for them to sprout, they have to go through a temperature of 650 degrees centigrade. This can only happen when there is a fire passing over them. But greasewood also produces seeds that do not need fire and they sprout like all other seeds as soon as they get wet. This is the way of the greasewood plant to make sure that its seeds sprout in both the conditions thus hedging its bed. Shrublands are a perfect place for animals to live and find food. But when it comes for humans to survive in such conditions, shrubland can be tough going for people. Yet, the pressure from human population is having a toll on the shrublands and they are facing a fight for survival.